data scientist at uh, Karlsruhe based uh, retail tech company called Blue Yonder. So let's give him a big hand. So um, I'm today talking about how to get to work with other ecosystems, um, but still keeping your Python land a bit. Um, there was already a short intro about me. Um, I'm a data scientist. Um, I'm actively working on the open source projects Apache Arrow and Apache Paki. I'm there in the project management committee. And I'm based in the Python, Siphon, C++ world. And I'm doing regularly a lot of SQL. Um, and I'm a heavy pandas user. So I'm home in Python. Um, Python is a really good companion for a data scientist. Uh, probably many of you are using pandas or so for doing data science work, shifting through the data, and covering maybe all the needs. But we're all, always quite home in our cozy Python area. Um, we have a lot of tools we can use, but in the end, we have to admit there are other ecosystems out there, and they have great tools too. And also, they maybe even have tools um, that are not available in Python yet, or are maybe not so kind of near to the nature of Python, so that we actually want to uh, talk with them together and, and also leverage these tools to do our work really fast and efficient. And Personally, for me, why do I care? Um, one and a half years ago, I had a main technical problem. I had a huge set of data. Um, a lot of files, um, the structure was quite good. Still, there were some variations. One of these files had a column more. Um, the types of the columns were not always the same. There were some of the columns were int, and in the other files, there were floating columns. And I wanted to dig in through the data. It was a terabyte big data set. So it wasn't a thing I could load into my memory using pandas, but I actually um, had to do with something larger scale. And luckily, just for looking at doing queries on this data, which do not touch all data, but just chunks of it, um, there are cool tools available. Um, there's Apache Hive, there's Presto, there's Apache Impala, and Apache Drill. Um, they all do this task really well. You can pick one of those. It will do it like you want it. They have certain things that are different between all of them, but they do a really good job. But my main problem is um, they're not in Python. So interacting with them from Python and to, Py to them from Python is not so easy. Um, you have to write routines to get the data in and out again. Um, often you have to do separate ones. They maybe bring Python drivers, but they're not so fast as you want. And also writing out data is often not the good interface. So for all these tools I mentioned just before, um, they are one common answer. Um, if you want to have your data ingested in these tools, use those tools, um, use the Parquet format. Um, that's a quite good answer because I don't know, I know now, I don't have to decide on one tool. I first just have to get my data out um, and then I can decide on which tool I want to use to continue. But sadly, this was two years ago and uh, two years ago, there was no Python Parquet client that was efficient. There was a few Python client, but this was really, really slow, and it would take ages just to export my data set from my current storage out of to the Parquet. Um, this is my main problem. This is why I came interested in this topic and why I dived a bit deeper. And it evolves a bit to a more general problem. Um, in our ecosystems, like PyDat, PyDataStack, interoperability is really good because you have libraries that back all this infrastructure normally. It's like PyData, we have always NumPy arrays. They're used in pandas and in SciPy again, and you can pass data around inside this ecosystem. But then if you want to go from Python to like R or the JVM, you don't have NumPy anymore. You have other data structures. These are already shared again in this ecosystem there, but it doesn't work so well good between them. The other thing is when you pass data around, this also costs a bit. Um, just if you do an operation and you copy memory, uh, on a consumer hardware like my laptop here, you often get around memory copy um, throughputs like 10 gigabytes per second if you're doing it quite good and align memory and so on. Um, then if you pass it to other systems, you have to serialize um, your data. And serialization is CPU overhead, which comes on top, which maybe even means that your data in a serialized form is stored in a different pattern of memory meaning you get a, lot, a huge drop on those 10 gigabytes per second, and also you have to waste more CPU cycles. Um, 
And then because you have different systems, you always need different conversion routines. Luckily, there's one standard every system supports, um, which is sadly the Pullman solution. You always have CSV. So every system, you can write out CSV and you can ingest CSV again. Um, the, the CSV path is always quite good optimized up to the point where you can optimize CSV. It's a human readable format. It's not standardized. So there's always CSV paths have to deal with a lot of quirks. Uh, and in the end, you cannot get as good as a native format um, with, with CSV, but it's everywhere. And also the other problem is you often have the luxury, you're sitting on your desk, you're working with your tools, and you can limit on these tools. But then in the end, you have colleagues or you have maybe um, other companies working with you together. And they m may not even have the same environment as you. So there's also a need to talk to them. You, ha you need to talk through APIs or through some kind of other layers. And to get a bit of scope, um, we're dealing normally with columnar data in data science paths. You often have tensors or matrices, but a lot of um, data is coming in the called columnar fashion. Um, columnar, this is boils mainly down that we have a table. Um, tables are 2D. Sadly, our main memory is 1D, so we have to map this 2D data to 1D addressable things. If you take a traditional database like MySQL, um, if you take a traditional store in there, it will be stored row-wise. Um, this is really good if you have storing data for a web log, where you want to have one table entry and fetch all those attributes of this one table entry and display it um, to the visiting user. Um, if you're doing like data analytics tasks, you normally have such queries, okay, get me the minimum of this column. Then you're not interested in just looking at the data for one row, you're actually interested in looking at the data of, um, all of one column, but of all rows. If you would then lay out the data in the row-wise fashion, you would always have to skip over the attributes you don't care about, meaning you have to make big chunks in the uh, when you're reading the memory. Um, to the design of CPUs, CPUs always fetch chunks of the memory, not only eight bytes, but 64 bytes or a kilobyte or so into their caches. And they get really fast if you use the caches correctly and use the instructions like SIMD instructions, which are SSE or AVX, which work on multiple values at the same time in a single CPU cycle. Um, then you can really use some really good and it's often magnitudes faster if you do this. And that's a benefit for us. If we're doing just analysis on one single column, and having the memory laid out that all values of a column are near together, things go really fast. And I already mentioned um, that all those engines use Parquet. And Parquet is some kind of one of the first de facto standards that worked out in um, data analytics or data processing to interchange data between various ecosystems. Um, it's an on-disk format. It's stored data column-wise. So we always have to persist to disk or so to exchange data. But it's also quite old, given the fast exchange in nature of the um, big data landscape. Um, five years in this terms is old. So um, it started 2012, just a project with Collider and Twitter. So that Twitter can analyze the logs so much faster but a year later, they had already the first stable release, and um, not a short time later, it became an official Apache project, and also a lot of companies adopted it in their Hadoop workflows, making it there already the de facto standard. And now since a year, we have full Python and C++ support, meaning that even if you're working Python, you can really fast export your data to Parquet and use other tools that work on Parquet. And in Hadoop ecosystem, like also in Spark, it's often the default option. If you open the Spark manual and you give a tutorial there and there, just I think at the first step, they start with reading CSV files or JSON files, depending on which tutorial you look at. But then they're silently saying, okay, if you want really performance, don't use JSON or CSV, just switch over to Parquet, and this will be fast. Sadly, there's no mention why it is fast. People just use it, and they're happy. That's a good thing. But it's a good choice often, because it helps you to interoperate. But what actually makes Parquet fast, why should you use it? Um, the first thing is the columnar format. So you can save your, mem um, your data you have in memory, because you're doing analytics, it's columnar, you can save it the same thing on disk. 
um, because it's on disk and you don't actually need fast random access, you can tune your data big because storage is costly, also a network bandwidth is costly, so you want to get your data small. Paquet applies two things for it. There's one thing, universal compression like GZIP or Fetch standard, which really makes the data small, but comes at great cost of CPU. The other thing is we have data column-wise, so everything is from the same type if you're in one region, and often values in the column are very similar. And that's where we apply encodings. Um, encodings are kind of the cheap variant of compression, but they're very effective because of the uniformness of the data there. So we can compress the data quite down without spending much of our CPU time and already get good compression rates. Another major selling point for Paquet, um, making it really good for these query engines I mentioned at the beginning is predicate pushdown. Predicate pushdown means if you have a query you want to um, evaluate on a huge data set of Paquet files, for example, an SQL query, um, it can do two things. The first thing is it's a columnar format. Your query will have um, some columns at the end as a result. It only needs to access these columns in the file. It can jump over all other columns in the file and doesn't even need to read them from disk, saving you that I already. But even if you're inside a column, you normally have a where clause at the end. And this where clause says, okay, I only want the columns that maybe are bigger than five. And there are already some, some clues in the paquet files that say, okay, if you want greater than five, then you don't need this chunk of data. Then you can also skip over a large number of rows. Um, I will detail two slides later um, how it actually works. And also, which makes it really good as a standard for shipping data from one system to another or interchanging it in, in a system, it has a lot of library implementations. So that Java and Scala and C++ library, they're now all mature. Recently, there was a .NET library, which is also nearly feature complete release. And then you can pass data around. And the format itself is not structured that it suits all um, data types or the data like you have in Hadoop. It's just so structured that it saves the data efficiently and doesn't make any assumptions under the, under the system if it works. Um, coming down, what is predicate pushdown? Predicate pushdown is the thing I mentioned earlier, which um, you can skip parts of your file. Not all, you don't need all columns, you don't need all rows. It saves you I.O. I.O. is mostly the, is the most um, costly part of your query transaction normally if you have a distributed system because your data is residing on one node. Luckily, if you have data locality, you maybe only need to read it from disk, but disk is already really slow compared to when you read it from memory. But if you're unlucky, your data is on another node, you need to transfer it over network, giving even a more limited bandwidth and even a higher latency. So you want to cut down on all I.O. If you're a bit nearer, then also you're limited by CPU. So if you can see, save a bit on the CPU side, it also gives you a bit of performance but mostly I.O. is your problem. For example, if you have a query on a data set which says, okay, which products are sold in dollars? For this, I only need to know which products and, and I need to know if the, if the currency is dollar or not. Having an example table, um, we saw here the first column is the product ID, a second column is a description, um, the third column is the currency, and the last one is the price. But actually for my query, I don't need um, the net description and the real price. I'm only interested in the currency and the product name. And in the end, I also got this hind in dollar. So if I already have enough statistics, and this is now kind of laboratory situation where you actually have statistics which say which line you actually only need, you also can skip one line because this product is sold in euro. And the perfect world, we will only need to load these four non grayed out blocks into memory and then can continue to evaluate our query. This is sadly not actually how it really works. Um, you don't normally always load data which is um, near these blocks, but it gives you already a good impression how it works. Uh, in the end, an actual physical paquet file, it's a file. But if you have talking about a paquet file or data set, you're normally talking about hundreds of files you have lying around which you just treat as a um, logical data set, but a, a logical file, a huge one, or a table, but in the end it's hundreds of files. Um, and that's a uh, file structure is mainly to suit your operating system. Your actually biggest unit you look at is a row group. A row group 
is a, num a huge number of rows, 100,000 to a million or so, or sometimes only 10,000, depending a bit on your data. Um, and in there is always the same types of columns. And columns, each column is of the same type um, in every file, hopefully. And these columns are also split into pages. Pages are the smallest unit Paquet files operate on. Um, typically, they're 16 kilobytes large because that's a nice amount you can load from disk, um, gives you good disk performance, and also a nice small amount you can work on a memory. That these are the, the units on you compress and encode. So if you want to, if you have data in a page, you have to load the whole page from disk and then can decompress it. And to make this predicate pushdown work, not only on columns, because columns are separately in the stored in this file, you have statistics. Statistics are on every level of the file, and you can look at those statistics, and they tell you, okay, the minimum maximum of this column is this. If you have a query testing for a lower or greater than, you can already know, do I need to load this page from disk or not? And it will tell you if you have to do it or not. And there's also, in your parquet files, these statistics are all um, placed at the end together with some metadata about the binary schema, which already gives you the, the benefit that you only need to read the footer. And if you have read the footer, you can basically all, um, already skip to the one page you need to um, where your result is in and don't need to read the other maybe 90% of the file, which is not interesting for your query at the moment. And the good thing which I talked about is um, there is Python support for reading Paquet files. Um, I am part of the Py Apache Arrow project. Um, we have um, Paquet support in the pyarrow.paquet module, um, usable by the code that's here. Um, I will upload the slides later. Um, just alternatively, there's also a fast Paquet module, um, which, is not, uh, which is based on um, number and LLVM to get your Paquet parsing. It's an alternative implementation, so you can try out both. But in the end, I think most of you people, if you work with Python, the interesting thing is just to have Pandas read it. And there will be a Pandas release maybe this week, maybe next week, um, that will bring you read Paquet and write Paquet functions where you can actually just store data frames directly into Paquet, independent of which library you use in the back end. Library choices may be dependent on which feature you need of the Paquet format or how fast it should be. And that brings us to the point where we now have a Python library and a format we, which you can use to exchange between different systems, like moving from one system to another ecosystem and have a good data interchange. But the big problem is we always persist after each step. So that's quite costly. We always write to disk or write maybe to RAM disk, which costs a lot of time. I already mentioned 10 gigabytes per second is memory copy. Um, doing Parquet even gives you more limitations because you do, do encodings and so on. But in the end, the really perfect world, you have zero copy data frames. Zero copy means actually you have a program which emits a data frame and have another program which just can work on that chunk of memory. And a typical example where you would expect this is, is kind of large scale, um, large scale distributed execution engine. Um, typically, the, the sh nice example here is where we now are applying um, other things to make it fast, is Spark. Spark, um, if you have used it from Python and if you try to retrieve your result as a data frame, it's quite slow um, because it has a really big overhead in serializing um, Java objects, serializing it in Python and making it into the structure you expect in Python. Um, at the moment, if the current release, you need about two and a half seconds to write one million integers from one uh, from a JVM process to a Python process. Um, one million integers sounds huge, but actually it's only eight megabyte. So if you have kind of small data, sending it from JVM to um, the Python world, it takes two and a half seconds, which is kind of really long. And to work around that, to have a format which you can use to best pass data frames between different systems without persisting them, the Apache Arrow project started. I actually came into that project because I only was looking for a Spark implementation, and now I'm also in, in this project. And it's mainly, the start point of it was a specification how you store data frames, columnar data in memory, so that if you have a system which has data analytics and want to interact with another system, can just store its data like this in memory, and the other system knows, okay, it's like 
it's looking like that. So I only need to write code to, re to ingest arrow data frames and to digest them. Um, then I can interact with a lot of other tools. Um, and it should bring me at the end that I don't have any big overhead of communication with other systems. And it also, this format arrow, I'm not going much into the detail here, but it's also laid out like the beginning, the picture of columnar data that is really stored like that your CPU can work efficiently with it, that you can make um, efficient queries on it. And also, nearly all the systems which dealing with columnar data have laid out memory, kind of the same thing. They're one of two um, bits always that are different. Malleability is changed and code in a different way. Some have bitmaps, some have byte maps, some just use floats if you have nullable um, columns. And the nice thing is after one and a half years in the project, we have already kind of a lot of um, support. We have Python, we have um, R, and we have the JVM, which are the three big ecosystems um, for data analysis. But we also have JavaScript, also on the browser side, um, which is kind of interesting. And the nice thing is Parquet, the Python implementation um, I was working on is purely C++, and there's no Python code in there. But where um, at the end there's an error data frame, uh, data frame on the arrow speak, it's a table, and we're just having small glue code on the Python side, which makes a C++ arrow table to a Python arrow table. Um, skipping over these two sides because of time. And bring us to the point where we are, can use our arrow on the current Spark master um, to convert from the JVM to Python um, the data frame results. And it brought us a speed up of a factor of 50, uh, 50 to 40 or so. Um, so that we the end, now for this example in the beginning, it only takes 0 0.05 seconds to transfer your results. This is also nice. In the near future, you will also have the support in UDFs in Spark, so that the difference between using a Python UDF and a Scala UDF shouldn't be that big anymore if you stick to the libraries that are really fast in Python, like using NumPy or Pandas in a Python UDF in Spark. Um, another different example from um, where Arrow actually brought me something. We had a problem some years ago. We wanted to get data as, as efficiently as possible out of the database. Um, the typical example is there, you have a database, you run a query. Um, the database is a, a large database which returns stuff in a columnar fashion. There is this standard called ODBC, um, which tells you how your data, your driver should look like. On the Python side, there is a tool um, called PyODBC which returns these results but it sadly returns them in a row-wise fashion because um, PyODBC is just written for the people who um, work on row-wise data. So it's a bit different to that how we um, uh, use it or expect it in a data science al application. And at the end, we get in a row-wise fashion, Pandas is comma again, so we had another serialization and transformation step, which actually really costly because turning a huge chunk of Python objects again into Pandas data frames costs a lot of CPU. So, and as always, Pandas has a good CSV parser. The database had a really good CSV export. Um, the most performance solution was use this at the beginning. But this was mainly down to the constraints that no one had um, built the right thing. Um, today, what we have as a solution is we're using TubeDBC, which is going to be presented to you tomorrow by Michael in his talk. Um, go visit it. But we have also integrated it with Arrow so that we get um, the, the data in most efficient form and or in the form we would expect it on a C++ site returned to Python so that we can ingest it with all the tools we have and also with nearly um, as a few copy as possible to really get it fast. Um, these were not two examples where Arrow was, is used. There are a lot of other things like example, the GeoMesa project. They're doing ge um, geographic mapping in Java and returning quite a lot of results they want to visualize and then they visualize um, the return these results as arrow tables, pass them to your browser, and in your browser they, they can directly use these arrow tables and then render it in WebGL to um, have a visualization to the user without big um, serialization overhead from passing data from your Java process on the server to the browser and the client. And also the last one as an example is the GPU Open Analytics Initiative, which is basically building a GPU data frame um, the nice thing is what they have, they are on a green field. So they can um, um, already start from scratch. I don't not limit it to current existing systems, but um, can start on new. And 
what they have is they have a data frame based on the R standard. There's a SQL database called MapD, which runs on your GPU, returns a result, gives you the pointer to this result, which is an error data frame. There's a library called PyGDF, where you can do data frame operations on this result returned from, your, from the database, and then pass the pointer to the memory region again um, to H2O, which does machine learning models on it. Meaning you have really zero copy um, interaction between two systems um, on it, or more systems on the GPU without having this big serialization overhead you get normally through interfaces, through network communication, and so on. Which is a really nice and one of the approaches where actually R wants to be in more parts. And also, it's open source projects, so all, always, when you're interested, when you have bug, when you want to implement features, just come talk to us and join the community. Yeah. Now open for questions. Thank you, Yuva, for this talk. Uh, do we have questions? Yeah. Yeah, thanks for your talk. Uh, I have one qu clarification question, actually. Parquet and um, Arrow, but aren't they basically doing the same thing, one via the file format and the other via main memory? But in the end, it's the same idea, right? Or am I missing something? It's very similar in approaches. So Parquet is one of the big inspirations for Arrow, but Parquet is about persisting for longer-term storage and also for, for encoder systems. So in Parquet, you're optimizing on size and on queryability that you get that you know which part you need to load. Arrow, it's really about really hot data. So an arrow, important thing which you don't have in Parquet is random access. And in arrow data frames are exactly the size you have but in memory. You have random access on the level of pages. You explained that before, even in no, Parquet, No, in, in, right? in arrow, you have random access on every bit of the data, on every row. So in Parquet, you have, you have semi-random uh, semi, um, access on the pages. You not have total random access on pages because pages are always 16 kilobytes big normally. But if you have an integer column and a string column, you don't have the same amount of rows in those so pages. You don't compress pages in Arrow. Yeah. Okay. No, in Arrow it's not compressed. Only in Parquet. Mm -hmm. uh, great talk. Thanks. Um, would you mind coming back to the initial problem you mentioned, where you've got like a terabyte of logs and you can't load it into pandas? If you don't have any experience with Arrow or Parquet, uh, and and less than pleasant experience with Spark, how would you suggest doing some analysis on a ter terabyte of logs, getting the Spark aspect started, and using the stuff that you just spoke about, preferably in pandas? So preferably in pandas. So the thing is, um, there are these tools, and you can actually use them from Python without. Um, noticing that they're not in Python. Um, storing Parquet is, is quite easy because you can use pandas, store them there, and they're not all tools yet available on this path I'm describing, but um, then you use these engines. You, you can either write an SQL query, get a result back. Maybe one of these engines may, has a driver which gives you a result in pandas. There, for example, Impala has an H2S viewer driver or so, which gives you something near to pandas. Um, but we hopefully see more pandas drives for them. But also there is from Wes McKinney and Philip Cloud the EBIS project, which you can use to have a pandas-like syntax, which then renders in the end SQL, which then can give you, you have a large data set, you use your pandas operations, and they go down then to um, the data and actually only pick up the data you actually need. The most important thing here for my problem is, and why I'm not using Spark or Dask, which is presented tomorrow, I'm not caring about loading all data into memory because I really know there is only a small subset I'm interested in. But uh, me as a, a user, I don't know which subset. And I need an engine that can d determine for me which subset it actually needs to load and which part of the file it needs to load. Because also it's called data. There's no indices and so on. Any more questions? You had the example where you copied eight megabyte of data from Java to Python. Why is it so slow? Um, yeah, it's this Spark example. In, sp in Spark, you have the internal structure um, of a data frame on RDD, which is, I'm not 100% sure how it is looking, but then you convert it on the Java side to rows. You then 
convert on the Java side to rows that roughly match the pickle format of Python. You push them over a network um, to Python. You deserialize every row into a Python object. And then you use these Python objects and turn them back again with pandas from records into um, Python objects, which is a lot allocating of Python objects, making a lot of memory, making a lot of intermediates, and all, all in a kind of inefficient format. And yeah, it's, it's a lot of deserialization overhead. It's a lot of code which probably is written from a non-Python developer just getting Python support there. But yeah. it helped out well because it stayed there a lot, long time in Spark. We have time for one more question, I think. Hey, um, so you said that uh, the, the data storage in Arrow is uncompressed, um, but there are also tools that compress the data in memory, actually, like B-Codes, for example. Uh, is there any integration between those? Is that possible? To um, there is, at the moment, no integration. We're preparing a bit to have a bit of compression. But one simple thing of art compression, um, what in Pandas is called categorical, is also available in Arrow, which is dictionaries, where you have, if you have a lot of repeated values, that you, always, that you store the values in a separate array and only have an array where you have the indices. That's the first simple part of compression which is in there, which you can do in memory with random access. Um, thank you. Uh, can you have a round of applause for him once again? <laughs> and we have a coffee break, I think, till 4 o'clock. So see you after this. <laughs>